Hello, my name is Ben Ryan. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Robert Malenka at Stanford University, and the overall goal of my proposal here to Mind Science is to understand how social experiences in early life shape the development of the brain. Early in childhood, you engage in some of the very first social encounters of your entire life. You go to preschool, you play on the playground, you make friends, and overall, through these experiences, you learn how to interact with others and you establish your own personality. It seems intuitive that this process might shape the brain, perhaps by strengthening the parts of the brain which control social functions, but we don't understand exactly how these interactions in early life contribute to brain development. Several brain areas are known to be involved in social functions, including a region called the prefrontal cortex, or the PFC. The PFC is important for guiding our social behaviors because it helps with making complex decisions, suppressing inappropriate actions, and many other functions which are very much involved in our social exchanges. The prefrontal cortex is also unique in that it finishes developing much later than other brain areas and remains flexible during early life. This indicates that PFC development may be sensitive to the experiences we have in childhood. So let's talk about how the prefrontal cortex actually works. All brain cells have a method of communicating with one another. In between cells, there are junctions called synapses, where one cell can release a substance called a neurotransmitter, which then binds to a receptor on the next cell. You can think of this process like one brain cell sending a piece of mail to another cell, which then goes into a mailbox and sends a message for that cell to either activate or turn off. In the PFC, the most common neurotransmitter is called glutamate, and when it's sent from one cell to another cell, it tells the receiving cell to activate. The amazing thing about synapses is that when they're used repeatedly, they can become stronger like a muscle. When a synapse is activated over and over, it will strengthen, and the next time that glutamate is released, it will cause the receiving cell to become more activated than it had been before. This process is called long-term potentiation, or LTP. So these glutamate synapses in the PFC appear to be very important for social functions. In my previous research, I found that mice with genetic mutations that are associated with autism have weaker glutamate synapses in the PFC, and these mice actually spend less time engaging in social interactions with one another. But when we restored the function of those glutamate synapses, the mice became more social. Now here's where things get really interesting. Other studies have shown that when mice are socially isolated during early life, their glutamate synapses in the PFC are weaker, they're actually immature, and as adults, these mice are less social. So could it be that social interactions during early life actually exercise and strengthen these synapses, just like working out a muscle? And are these social interactions required to strengthen these synapses so that they can properly regulate social behaviors in adulthood? In all of these species, being isolated in early life results in abnormal social behaviors in adulthood. Take for example the unfortunate case of Jeannie, a child who was held in total isolation until she was 13. After her release, she had very poor social skills with almost no facial expressions or body language and limited ability to express herself. This all seems to indicate that social experiences are not just important for strengthening these synapses, but that these changes may be important for the development of proper social functions. Our research goals are to test whether social experiences directly strengthen glutamate synapses in the PFC and whether these changes are required for the development of social functions. To answer this, we will first test in mice whether engaging in a social interaction directly strengthens glutamate synapses in the PFC. Mice are very social animals, which makes them a good model organism for studying this process. To measure the strength of these synapses, we will use a technique called electrophysiology. In electrophysiology, we look at the brain under a microscope and place a tiny electrode which measures electrical signals directly onto a brain cell. We can then stimulate the surrounding cells to cause them to release glutamate and measure how strong the response is in the cell that we're recording from. This allows us to directly measure the strength of the synapses on the cell that we've chosen. So how do we know what cells to record from? We know that we want the cells that are involved in social functions, and there's actually a way that we can target them specifically. Here at Stanford, another lab has developed genetically modified mice which allow you to literally see what brain cells are activated during an experience because they light up bright red. Using this technology, we can place a mouse into a social interaction, and afterwards, all of the brain cells that were activated by that experience will turn fluorescent red. This process is called trapping the active neurons. What we plan to do is give the mice a series of social interactions and trap the active neurons. Then, using electrophysiology, we will measure the strength of the glutamate synapses only in the red cells. This will allow us to test our hypothesis that social experiences in early life directly strengthen glutamate synapses on brain cells in the PFC that control social functions. 
As scientists, we must consider all possibilities, and there is a chance that social encounters do strengthen these glutamate synapses, but that those changes are not critical for the development of social functions. In order to really know this, we need to test whether the strengthening of these synapses is absolutely necessary for the development of social functions. In order to do this, we will breed new mice that are like the trap mice, but slightly different. Instead of the active neurons turning fluorescent red, those active neurons will lose a gene that is necessary for the strengthening of glutamate synapses. In other words, we have come up with a method to prevent brain cells in the PFC that are involved in social functions from strengthening their glutamate synapses. At an early age, we will place these mice into a social environment and trap the socially activated neurons in the prefrontal cortex. This will prevent them from strengthening these glutamate synapses with each subsequent social encounter that the mice have. In a way, we're sort of preventing the social muscles of the brain from growing, even though they're being exercised. Now, remember I mentioned earlier that mice isolated in early life show social deficits in adulthood. We hypothesize that these mice will show similar social deficits despite being housed with other mice and not being socially isolated. They will have social experiences, but since the brain can't strengthen those glutamate synapses, they won't be able to properly develop social abilities. This would indicate that these synaptic changes in the prefrontal cortex, which are driven by experience, are absolutely necessary for the proper development of social functions. In summary, this proposal will accomplish several goals. First, it will help us understand how social experiences in early life shape the development of our brains and our social abilities. Second, we will better understand how social isolation affects the developing brain. And finally, these findings may pave the way for future studies investigating this process in autism spectrum disorder. Through this work, I hope that we will better understand how interacting with others, starting with our very first social encounters, can shape the way our brains function forever, and how these interactions establish the basis for the way that we consciously interact with the world around us.